Okay, as I, as I said a few minutes ago, the, uh, uh, this is the first day of Black Holes Week, first lecture. Uh, we'll have another Black Holes lecture on Thursday. And, uh, but today we have a ton of clicking. We have about 900 clicking questions. And so if you're sitting over on the right side of the room and towards the back, you just might want to move towards the front because your clicker, if it's not clicking in, if I'm not getting every one of your clicks, it's going to put a big dent in your clicking score today. I mean, it's, we, that's how many clicking questions we got. Because I'm going to be taking you through some black hole concepts that are um, in addition to the, and that, that, that applies to you guys uh, on the, in the, this section over here as well. If you're sitting back there in the back row over there, uh, you might want to move a little f further forward. You know, you don't have to, but if you want clicks to come in loud and clear, that's what you're going to do. Um, yeah, we're going to start with a common everyday explanation of black holes in terms of escape velocity. And then I'm going to work you through some questions with eye clickers to really get you to think geometrically. And so we have a ton of eye clicker questions. Uh, the first eye clicker question is a short answer question. Um, and we're going to try to get to, um, to understand the very simplest kind of a black hole which is called the Schwarzschild black hole. Now, you're not going to have to spell that out on like a spelling test. It's one of those infinitely misspellable German names, kind of like Brickner. Okay? But Schwa Professor von Schwarzschild, actually, he wasn't a professor. He was a, a young guy. Um, actually, he was about 40 something years old. Uh, he died in World War I uh, soon after he wrote his pa famous paper about black holes. Anyway, uh, we're going to be talking about the geometric uh, nature of black holes, which is the essence uh, of black holes. So uh, clickers, um, and let's do a, a short answer question here. Now, which one, this is, this, everybody's going to get correct answers on this one. Um, which is your favorite black hole concept? Just choose whichever one you like. Are they voting? Yep, good. All right. And you know, the thing is, if I wanted to, I could actually make a, um, uh, I could make a code question out of this, you know, put together their own sentence. Don't sit back there, son. Sit forward. Your clicks are not going to come in from back there. Okay, 10 seconds to vote. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Okay, uh, go ahead and show this, uh, please, Miss Jenny. Um, and it looks like a lot of you voted for D, majority. I'll go back to regular. Um, and, uh, you know, a good, but there was people sprinkled all over the other answers. Uh, if you dive in a black hole, you come out in another part of the universe. Uh, go ahead and scribble all that out. That's a bunch of BS, all that. All those are misconceptions about black holes. So I, I, I don't want to say that I suckered, suckered you into that, but it is a misconception. Each one of those. Um, Black holes don't suck in everything that's around them. A black hole um, can be measured even though you cannot formally see it. And we know that from Kepler's third law, of course. I've talked about that out the wazoo. There is such a thing as a black hole. We have, you know, several uh, objects. And even though we're not up close enough to actually see stuff, because uh, they're in distant star systems, you know, many, many light years away, uh, we pretty convinced that there's a black hole, including the one at the center of our galaxy, which is about 8,000 
parsecs away, about uh, 20 something thousand light years away. And this thing about coming out in another part of the universe, uh, yeah, that's nice for Hollywood, but it's, it's not, that's not the geometry of most black holes. And some black holes that have spin, you know, they spinning black holes, it's a little bit fancier than what we're going to study today. Uh, you know, they, you know, you can make arguments about that, but still uh, definitely not very practical. So let's get down to brass tacks. Uh, this is a good concept, escape velocity. Um, and it's the colloquial way to, and in fact, it's the, it's what Sir Isaac Newton would have thought if he had, you know, thought in these terms. Um, that if, you know, that if something is so massive and dense that even light itself cannot escape, um, that's, that's not a bad definition of a black hole. It's not the best. It's kind of a dynamical um, definition instead of geometric. But free fall velocity in general depends on the mass of the planet or the star um, and how high up it is when you drop it. So, so what you do is you think about free fall like from point P1 here, okay, and you drop, you know, like uh, you drop a baseball towards the surface of this greenish yellow planet. And just before impact, it has a certain free fall velocity. All right, now, um, escape velocity is the um, velocity from the biggest possible drop height. So if you, so for instance here, if you take this um, trajectory, you know, in other words, go out a little bit further to point P2. Yeah, okay. You know, you, you take an identical baseball and you drop it onto this greenish yellowish planet, then by the time it impacts, um, yeah, you're going to have more velocity than, you know, if you drop it from point P1. All right. And if you go a little further out, here's another. Now the green yellow planet is receding into the distance. Well, there's point P3. It's, it's way out there. And if you drop a baseball from that height, you're going to get a lot more speed at impact. All right. And so the whole idea of escape velocity is this. You know, it, and, and here's, here's one way to think about it. Think about a baseball pop-up. If you have a baseball pop-up and it goes straight up, you know, straight up from home plate, you know, it has a certain initial velocity and then it gets up to its maximum height and then it comes straight back down. And the moment that the catcher catches it, it has, it's, it's got a drop speed or a drop free fall velocity that's exactly the same size as the, velo as the velocity or the speed that it had when you popped it up. So, you, so for instance, you can make a note of this, free fall pop-up or baseball pop-up straight up, a perfect pop-up. In other words, not one that's going to go into the outfield to the pitcher or something, but straight, perfectly straight up. If it leaves the bat 20 meters per second, for instance, all right, that's good. It'll go way up there. 20 meters per second, going straight upward. Then on the way back down, when the, when the catcher catches it, you know, because, you know, when you hit the baseball, it's about mm, chest high, waist high, depending. And so that's where the catcher's going to catch it. He's going to catch it, you know, about chest high, maybe, about here. Okay, so they, they end at the same. So when the catcher catches it, it's going 20, miles, uh, 20 meters per second, but it's going downward. That's the only difference. All right. So the drop velocity or the drop speed is the same as the, the pop-up speed, you know, the initial speed, if you're going straight up. Now, if you're going at a slant, it's a little different. All right. Now, if you had a pop-up that was going fast enough, in other words, if you were like Iron Man or somebody, and you had you just totally crush it, except you crush it upwards, it could escape Earth's gravity because it would attain the same drop velocity if you dropped it from an infinite distance. 
right? So the limit, so I put a, so up here is a little, let me get my cursor over here. Up here in the upper right is a little teeny greenish dot. You know, the same one that we were looking at before. All right, and there's the drop, and you know, there's the drop trajectory, except at the, at the bottom left here, I have a little squiggle and an arrow indicating that somewhere out there is where you actually dropped it. All right, so, so theoretically that means in the limit of distance going to infinity, that drop speed is what a baseball would need to get to exceed, actually, to get to infinity. And, and if you want to totally escape the gravitational attraction of Earth or whatever planet you happen to be on, you want to, in other words, you want to go to infinity and beyond, then you have to have just a one more meter per second of speed than, you know, whatever this particular drop speed is. So, and, and my, as I said before, my wonderful students, this escape velocity is the same as the drop speed from infinity, all right? And that depends on the mass and the size of the planet, that's it. You know, so how many kilograms of mass? You know, and we know how many kilograms approximately the Earth is, and we know its diameter, its radius, and the circumference and everything, so. And we, you know, you could figure it out. I mean, for Earth, it's about 11,200 meters per second. So that's about 25,000 miles per hour. Now, nobody, not even Chuck Norris, is going to get uh, 25,000 miles per hour on a pop-up. But I mean, if he did, you know, this is, you know, it would escape uh, the gravitational pull of the Earth. And if he had 25,001 miles per hour, he'd be able to head to the moon or to Mars or, you know, some other gravitational object. He'd be free of Earth. So that's escape velocity. Uh, for the moon, it's a little bit smaller. Er, the moon is a smaller object, less mass, less radius, uh, 2,400 meters per second. So, so for instance, the Apollo astronauts, you know, when they took off from Earth, they had this ginormous Saturn V rocket, which apparently... Now they have this, is Falcon, was the Falcon Heavy bigger than Saturn V? I've heard it's pretty, not in physical size, not in physical size but in, in thrust and everything. So the, this new Falcon Heavy they got is as powerful as the Saturn V. So the Saturn V is as long as a base, excuse me, as long as a football field and longer. And so they needed all that power, all that, uh, liquid rocket fuel in you know all three stages to get outside of Earth's gravitation, gravitational pull, 11,200 meters per second, about 25,000 miles per hour. Uh, but to do the same thing from the moon, they just needed a little bit of fuel. And getting off the moon, they, you know, they had a fairly small object. And I don't know how big their hydrazine tank was, but the, um, you know, the fuel that they used in the lunar module to lift off from the surface of the moon uh, was much smaller. They didn't, you know, they needed to burn a, a powerful amount um, to get up to, actually, you know what it was, it was that, it was the lunar module and then the, um, you know, the command module, the, you know, they made up and then they head back to Earth together. Uh, and that's the one that had to get escape velocity, so it had a little bit more fuel up there. But uh, for it to get up into orbit, it was pretty small amount. And then uh, you can see a much smaller escape velocity from the surface of the moon. Here's Mars, 5,000 meters per second. So that's about, you know, it's you know maybe 1,100 miles per hour, or 11, I should say, uh, 11,000 miles per hour. There you go calculated out. Sun. You know, so, so it just depends on what object you're talking about. Now 61 or 617,600 meters per second, that's about 0.2 percent of the speed of light. So it's fast, but all the photons from the surface of the SUN are way faster than that. So they don't have any problem. All right. And 
so the SUN is, as we know, it's not a black hole. The, the grains, the, the particles of light that we call photons, you know, they travel at the speed of light by definition or by law of nature, I should say. Uh, and so, they're, you know, it's, they're way faster, you know. So what is that? 500 times faster than uh, escape velocity. So, but it's possible, you know, and the, the guy that figured this out back in the 1700s, kind of an interesting guy, you know, he figured it out, yeah, stars got to have about 500 times more gravitational pull before it's going to threaten um, uh, the speed of light. And so, uh, so this whole idea um, of an object um, that has such strong gravitational pull that even light cannot escape, that's not a, a bad way of looking at a black hole. And it was actually uh, figured out by this fellow in about 1783. So what is that? Uh, 235 years ago, uh, John Mitchell, he was, a, if he was formerly a professor of geology at Cambridge, and then he became um, a pastor up in Yorkshire. But, but in those days, everybody, you know, everybody was able to still be, you know, he was, he was famous in geology and he was famous in astronomy as a professor. And he continued his astronomical and geological work um, as a pastor, as well as being a pastor. You know, all that, all that that entails up there in Yorkshire. Anyway, so he had this famous paper in uh, 1783, 1784 it was published. Ooh, I wrote down the the, uh, the extremely long name of it, but I forgot to put it in there. I'll give it to you on two, on Thursday. And he speculated that some stars might, as I said, might be so dense that light itself cannot escape. And this is what we call a Newtonian black hole. And it just so happens that when you work out all the physics, uh, this is uh, a valid concept for figuring out the size and mass of a Schwarzschild black hole. Now, the Schwarzschild spherical black hole is the simplest one, and that one is it obeys the space-time geometry principles of Einstein's theory of relativity. And just so you know, you can make a note of it, Einstein's theory of relativity is um, completely consistent. Let me, let me reverse that. Newtonian uh, universal gravitation is entirely consistent with Einstein's theory of relativity. Okay, and Einstein's theory of relativity has been uh, verified um, to the nth degree. It's, it's extremely solid experimentally in many ways. Um, and so, uh, and it, it just happens that what John Mitchell figured out uh, concerning the speed of light and you know about 500 times the gravitational pull. Yeah, that's that's consistent with uh, what Einstein and Schwarz, Professor Schwarzschild would have said back in 1915. By the way, the Schwarzschild black hole was first proposed in a paper written by uh, Carl Schwarzschild in 1915. So that's about 103 years ago. And for many years, people th said, dude, that's a nice little thing, you know, but it's, you know, it's impossible, you know. And until about the 1950s and early 60s, nobody really paid it much attention. It's just like, you know, it's like, it's like you know, a, a theorem in, in, um, in mathematics, some obscure pattern in, in prime numbers, you know, like Fermat's last theorem or something like that. It's very interesting, but it's not practical, you know. And, uh, you know, they thought, well, black holes, yeah, okay, technically, yeah, it can happen. Uh, you know, a Newtonian black hole, an Einstein-flavored black hole, and they're consistent. Uh, but, yeah, we're never going to, I mean, it's just, you know, it's nice, but it's not, except it actually is. And we've, we've now um, discovered... Uh, several objects. We've mentioned several of them. 
Uh, this is an artist's conception of a black hole, uh, and what we call an astrophysical black hole. Go ahead and make a note of that. There's a couple different uh, regimes or um, ranges of black hole, and the, the main thing is the mass of the black hole. Okay, it might be spinning, it might have a single electron, a little bit of electric charge, uh, but basically the, the basic idea of the black hole is its mass. If it's got about 20 times the mass of the sun, uh, a star, it has a good probability of you know, going into core collapse supernova and leaving behind a neutron star that instantaneously crushes itself under gravity and cannot stand up and becomes a black hole. And um, what, what we see um, about an astrophysical black hole is typified by this diagram here. Uh, for instance, go ahead and make a note, uh, constellation Cygnus, a uh, summertime constellation, the Swan, it's also known as the Northern Cross. It's uh, swimming down the, or it's flying down the Milky Way uh, towards Sagittarius. It's pointed at the center of our galaxy in Sagittarius. Uh, and Cygnus X1 was discovered back in the 70s, actually the 60s, and then they figured out in the 70s um, that it was something like this. That there was a, that they could see this blue giant star. They could see that. And they could see near it a source of x-rays. Now that's that stuff burning up left, you know, uh, up and, and down from the center of that black hole. Now that, that swirly stuff that's what we call the accretion disk, just like for neutron stars. And black holes have very, very hot accretion disks. And so that kind of orangey, reddish, swirly uh, accretion disk uh, is, is uh, we think, the source of x-rays. And we think that those two spikes coming up above, straight up and straight down, those are called jets. And those jets we think also can be sources of x-rays. And we can see those, all right? So we don't really see, so this astrophysical black hole, you know, stars, and there's, there's lots of stars above 20 solar masses. And this is the famous, uh, or this, uh, the, the one I'm talking about, Cygnus X1, is the famous one. It's pretty much the first black hole candidate that they got serious about. And it, because it, it, it was an X-ray source, Cygnus X1, X-ray source number one in the constellation Cygnus. And it had a companion. And they could see the companion. They could see the companion doing a dance. In other words, they could use Kepler's third law and work out that the thing that this blue giant that they could see and the location of the X-ray source that they could see, the accretion disk, uh, and they could see it on X-ray, you know, the X-ray satellites, uh, that they were fast enough and the right size that it had to be a black hole. Right? So Kepler's third law said, yeah, you guys, this is looking, and we've, we're still trying to observe it. And we could see it in radio frequencies, uh, X-ray frequencies, and so forth. And uh, it's... it's uh, uh, so this is a, what we call an astrophysical black hole, uh, or an example. It's a picture of what we would call an astrophysical black hole, and a good example of that is Cygnus X1. Second category of black hole that we can also see and figure it out by what happens around it is um, a galactic black hole. So first, first kind, first group, astrophysical. Second group, galactic. And... The first group, astrophysical black hole, we know pretty much how they're going to form. A supernova detonation of some kind, core collapse type 2, uh, and then collapse to neutron star, and then on down to black hole. So, but galactic black hole, like Sagittarius A star, the one that we've also been talking about this semester, that's the second group, uh, galactic black hole, uh, we don't know how they form. I mean, it, may, it might be that it started out as a, you know, an astrophysical black hole, but the mass of a galactic hole is measured in millions of times the mass of the sun. Now, we don't think that there are any stars that form 
above more than a few hundred times the mass of the sun. So um, the galactic black hole, we do not think, is one ginormous star that collapsed. And we think it's, well, we don't know. We're, we're still working out the physics of the galactic black hole. But galactic black holes measured in millions and even some of them are really big, billions of solar masses. Uh, we can see them in x-rays. We can see them in um, infrared, you know, radio waves. Uh, the first measurement of the galactic black hole, SGRA star, was actually in radio waves. I was looking at that uh, last night. Uh, back in, uh, I think, 1973 or maybe 1993. Something with a three at the end of it. Anyways, um, so uh, astrophysical black holes from regular stars, about 20 masses of the sun or more. Uh, galactic black holes, millions or even billions of solar masses. Don't know how they form. Another kind, purely conjectured, uh, very small, are called primordial black holes. Okay, so this is, we don't have any evidence of them. Uh, we would like to, we, uh, and a primordial black hole is a black hole that formed um, uh, during the Big Bang. Now, last time I gave you an image of the uh, Planck satellite and the uh, Wilkinson satellite image of the uh, cosmic ray background, and we looked at all the little bluish red uh, ups and downs, the little variations in the cosmic microwave background. And every density variation in there, uh, we would like to think that, it, that the early universe, during the first few seconds of the Big Bang, uh, had density perturbations that could have formed a, a black hole. Now, we don't have a real good handle on the physics. One of the things that I, my research is about is about primordial black holes and, and how they detonate uh, and, and cause mayhem in the early universe. It's kind of cool when you're a scientist. You can, you know, you, most of the time you don't get to blow things up, but you can simulate the you-know-what out of it. Uh, anyway, so primordial black, so the three categories, uh, astrophysical, and we've seen plenty of candidates for those, galactic, black holes, ginormous, in the center of many galaxies, some people speculate every galaxy's got one, and then very um, theoretical, not yet observed, primordial black holes, could be this, we don't, we don't know how big they could be. They could be small as the Earth itself or, or even smaller. You know, there's, because we don't, the, the, black, the first few seconds of the Big Bang are so uncertain to us that we don't know, you know, like Kepler's law would be nice, but we're not going to get any Kepler's law action in the first few seconds. We can't even see the first few seconds of the black hole. We could maybe see... Uh, in the cosmic microwave background, there's hope that we can see the signs of much earlier black, primordial black holes, but it's still uh, uncertain about that. So those are the three kinds of black holes. Um, astrophysical black hole, pictured here. Uh, galactic black hole, example, Sagittarius A star, which we've talked about. And we'll talk about that on, t on Thursday as well. And then primordial black holes, which uh, I don't even know how you make a picture of that, but I mean, it's a speculative bubbling of the early universe, the first few seconds of the Big Bang. Now, I mentioned to you, and we're, we're going to focus on astrophysical black holes today. I mentioned to you that the light cone um, is the real tool for understanding. Uh, a black hole. And uh, here's a picture of a black, uh, a, a light cone. And what we're going to do now is run through some clicker questions, uh, mostly multiple choice. And uh, so have your clicker out. And you guys in the back, I keep t telling you over there, you're, you better move somewhere closer because if we don't get your clicks from back there, there's a million clicks in the big slug of clicking is about to start. You might want to move forward. There's so many clicks today that'll put a big dent in your clicking. But if you're up here in the front row, I'm going to get a hold of them. It's what we want. All right. So um, 
let's ask a few more clicking questions uh, in, in iClicker. First one, hopefully this one's cinchy. How far does a photon of light move in one second? Okay, good. You guys aren't moving. Good, fine. Whatever you want to do. You're probably okay back there. Yeah, you're all right. That, that side of the room is copacetic, but that, that's farther away from me over there, so. Okay, 10 seconds to vote. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, one. Time is slowing down. Zero. Click. Okay, yeah, most of you guys got it. Now, I'm going to draw some diagrams. One light second. That's how far. I, I mean, you know, in a year, it goes a light year, right? Right. And uh, Earth, and side note, one astronomical unit. How many light seconds in an astronomical unit? You remember? Five, 16, no, it's 500, 499 point something. So round it off to 500. Yeah, don't forget that. It's a good, it's a nice, easy one to remember. All right, what I want you to do, we're going to draw a sketch from this, okay? So I'm using my clicker questions here to kind of instruct you and, and kind of get you to think. And just to, as, as I mentioned before, I want you to be thinking very carefully today because we're going to be tackling geometric concepts. The, the key to understanding a black hole is its geometry. And light cones, which we're starting to form, those are the, the tool that will reveal the unusual uh, space-time geometry around a black hole. So in relativity, we, temp we usually make the temporal or time axis vertical, and the spatial axis in light seconds uh, horizontal, okay? So go ahead and do that. Make a vertical axis, label it time in seconds, and then the horizontal scale, label that one x, I may as well call that the x axis, uh, and label that in ls, light seconds. All right, so every square here is going to correspond to one second vertically and one light second horizontally. All right, so that's good. All right, so here's, here's one set. So go on up. You know, go, leave your spells, yourself a little bit of room uh, for a few more seconds of time on the time axis, temporal axis. And there's my sideways line. And here's, and make it a square. In this scale, one light second corresponds to one um, second of, of travel time. So go ahead and put a dot there. All right, I'm putting a red H alpha photon there. All right, because that's, you know, if it starts down here at the origin, you could put a dot down here. That's where you are. All right, you are here at the origin. All right, if you send out a photon, a red H alpha photon in one second, that's where it is on this graph, right? This space time uh, diagram. All right, now let's do two seconds. So go up and about the same distance up, kind of eyeball it. So, notebook, if you're doing notebook paper, you got it. If you got graph paper, even better. Um, and then, kind of over here at two light seconds to the right, right kind of sketch that in. And, all right, two seconds later, my red H-alpha photon, bing, it's on out there. All right. So we're doing good. And it, this is pretty cinchy. You know, on this, this particular scale with light seconds horizontally and seconds vertically, it's cinchy to map out a photon. And here's three seconds. And hopefully this is getting boring because it's very easy to do. Three seconds out, three light seconds to the right. There's the photon. All right, so 
Um, go ahead and, and I'll just burn in a dashed line if you like uh, to represent the uh, pathway through the space-time diagram. So we, and we've, we've mapped out three locations, three events. You wouldn't say in, in, in this one, because time is part of the coordinate system in this graph, you wouldn't call this a location, you would call it an event. In other words, a, a place and a time. Okay, so these are events. And here's another way to look at it. You can, you know, add this to your diagram if you like. And so the basic idea here is that in this scale, which is typically the one that we use, to spe we use especially with black holes, um, the, uh, if, if you map out the path of light, it's always going to be on 45 degree lines. Now that's for one that's emitted from down here. So you're down here at the origin and you, you turn your, your, your H alpha flashlight to the right. And so this photon is moving to the right towards positive X. Okay. And so you, you aim your flashlight to the right and you blink out one photon, one red photon. And this would be where it and this is a theoretical graph, so it's, um, it, it would be at 45 degrees. And if you did something to the left, that'd be tilted the other 45 degrees. We'll do that in a second. And so, um, as I mentioned already, the, the, the path, what light does in space-time of a black hole or a neutron star, neutron stars are pretty... Um, you, you have to use Einstein's theory of relativity for neutron stars as well. Uh, but black holes are what we're talking about now. And black holes are particularly intriguing. So, um, but it's the key. You know, what light does. And the, the interesting thing about light is what black holes do, they, they bend the path of the light and they change, uh, change how it looks uh, they, and you can even get a red shift or a blue shift, so it'll change the color of the photon, depending on the observer. So you emit it here, you're the sender at the origin here, and if somebody's up here, you're, you have a friend that's out here at four uh, light seconds away from you. You know how far four light seconds would be? Three times 10 to the eight meters, 300 million meters in four seconds or times four seconds. So that would be 12 hundred million meters for light seconds. It's farther than the moon. The moon is about one point something light seconds um, away from, from Earth. So the past, think about that. One second in the past is almost as far away from you as the moon when you think about it in, in four dimensions. All right, so let's do the full. Okay, hopefully you can extend your, your diagram over here to the right or to the left. Here's the here's the other side. Now you know, so if you have a if you turn your red H alpha flashlight and you and you beam one photon to the left, it's going to form this, this other 45 degree line. All right. Now, if you have something that's a little bit slower than the speed of light, it's going to look like this. It's going to be going left, but it's not going to go as far in one second as light does. Light goes the furthest. So this one's going to be a little tiltier. All right. So that might be you know, it might be 40, uh, 48 degrees above the x-axis, you know. And so this would be considered something moving off to the left. You know, so that could be like uh, a Ferrari or a Proton or, you know, anything moving off to the left. It's going to be somewhere over here on this side. Okay, now over here, uh, this would be something rightward. All right. And... They're both slower than the speed of light. 
So let me ask you a question here. Let's look, let's look at this, the left word and the right word. And I want you to think carefully. This one, just to, you know, consult with your neighbors. Which object is moving faster? And think about it. Talk to your neighbors. Check with your neighbor. Consult with your neighbor. What, what doth thine neighbor think? What do you think? Good, I see people consulting and stuff. Good. Basically, I'm asking, what does the steepness mean? Right? I mean, you can, you can see obvious differences in the steepness. You know, the tilt angle. And, you know, what does that mean? So this is asking, you know, one, one of us going left and one of us going right. So their, their velocity would be leftward or rightward, but their speed, you know, the speedometer rating is going to be different or the same or, you know, whatever you decide. 20 seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Okay. Um, go ahead and show this. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, unclick that. Okay, now show it. All right, so a bunch of you, most of you voted for either A or B. A few uh, sprinkled yourselves down there in C and D. Okay, switch back now, and you can rate it. Uh, correct answer is this one. Now, why is that? It's Here's one way to think of it. It's closer to the photon line. It's tilted almost all the way down. The thing to the left, that bluish line. And then this one over here, the one that's moving to the rightward, it's almost straight up and down. Now, here's, a, here's something that I want you to add to your notes. If you are down here at time t equals zero and you beam out the two photons, one to the left, one to the right, okay, um, and if you stay at that position, if you don't move, then you're always going to be on the time axis. So write this down. The stationary observer is on the time axis. All right. And there's profound uh, meaning in that that we'll talk about on Thursday. I can't underestimate that, but we'll get to that on Thursday probably. Right now, um, so if you're stationary um, and you start at the origin, you're going to stay at x equals zero, and but you're going to occupy different events at x equals zero. You know, one second, two seconds, three. So you're going to be on the straight vertical line. The blue one going leftward is. You know, he's almost tilted over to the maximum speed, speed of light. And the black one is actually tilted a little bit closer to the stationary observer's position uh, on this graph, which is the time axis. So you can think of it that way. And in realistic terms, um, nothing that we can do on Earth, except for maybe particle accelerators uh, out at Stanford or... or uh, Geneva or Long Island's different, these exotic atom smashers. Uh, we can get stuff out close to the photon line, but most of our stuff is really close to the time axis because we're pretty slow. You know, that the escape velocity for the sun, 0.2% of the speed of light uh, is, you know, it, it'd be really close to the, you know, escape, if, if I mapped out escape velocity for the sun, it'd be really close. You couldn't even see it compared to this time axis. Now, um, as a fourth note, 
on this. Okay, the third one was the time axis, station obs area, stationary observer. Fourth note, um, nothing in, in, in Einstein's theory, nothing can go faster than the speed of light. All right, so this stuff over here, you can't get a photon. You can't. If you're right here at time t equals zero, there's no way that you can get anything over there below the right side, below that right photon line. And by the same token, um, oops, wrong way. Uh, you can't do anything over here either on the left. So, so in, the, in the law of cause and effect, or as we say in physics, causality, um, everything that you can do, your entire future is inside that 45 degree uh, polygon, right? And it's actually, so you're here, and you can affect stuff in the white area above the photon trajectories. So the blue line, yeah, you could produce that if you have a, a big enough rocket engine. The black one, yeah, you could do that. If you have a good enough accelerator, yeah. And we can get electrons and protons up to, you know, like real close to the photon line. We can get them real, or as we say, close to the light cone. Um, uh, because the, the, the three-dimensional ver version of this, just think of this as rotating and forming a cone, a 90-degree cone. Uh, so everything inside that cone is uh, your future. And nothing outside of it, um, you, can, you can never get to any of those events. Now, those events can, you know, if you have an event out here, if you have an observer over here, yeah, he can send something to the left, but it won't get to you until way up in here somewhere. So let's do another clicker question. Here we go. All right, on graph paper marked out in seconds vertically, light seconds horizontally. Okay, that's what we're doing here. Remember, you want to think geometrically here. Go ahead and grade this one. Anytime we get about that rate, we can grade it. Fifteen seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Uh, yeah, uh, most of you got this, 96% of you. It's right there. I mean, it's the, you know, that's the, that's the photon path. So it's 45 degrees left, to, you know. And just to emphasize, go ahead and add this to your sketch. Everything inside that is slower than the speed of light, right? So cars, Ferraris, trains, the bullet train in Japan. Has anybody ever, raise your hand if you've ridden on uh, a bullet train either here in the US or over in Europe or Japan. It's cool. It's, I've ridden on the Acela up, up between New York and uh, Washington DC. It's, it's kind of scary actually. Uh, so anyways, this, this bullet trains, everything is in there. And we can, get pretty st we can get stuff pretty darn close, but theoretically, only photons actually are on that dashed line, no matter what the color is. Now, next eye clicker question. I want you to think about this one carefully. It's a geometry question. You aim two photons... 60 degrees apart. You know, so after two, two seconds of travel, you know, they're both going to be two, two light seconds away from the start. Right? Oops, my 60 is a little bit blooped there. So that's a 60 degree angle between those two blue photon paths. Okay, so now this one's not a, a space time diagram. It's just, you know, kind of a overhead view of two photons motating through time. Uh, 
uh, how much, how many light seconds will separate them? Right. Now you don't have to do any trig for this, although you could, you can grade that. 10 seconds to vote. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Ching. Uh, yeah, most of you got this one right. Uh, those three locations form a right, or excuse me, an, an equilateral triangle. So that question mark there is two light seconds. Two, two, and two. All right. If you have a 60 degree angle and two equal segments, then the third segment has to be the same size. And it's a 60, 60, 60 equilateral triangle. Now, make a note. I hope you wrote this sketch down. These two rays are diverging. Very important. These two uh, H gammas, so these are blue, so you're one of the purpley blue H's. So H gamma, these two H gamma photons, uh, they're diverging. You know, so every two seconds, you know, they're a little further. You know, so, and so the line segment between them keeps getting bigger and bigger. Right, so that's what diverging means. Okay, my wonderful students, diverging means, diverging photons means, the, f the line segment to, between them gets bigger and bigger. If they're converging, you know, they're getting closer and closer. The line segment, so make a note of that, converging means that the distance between them gets smaller and smaller. Okay, now these ones are diverging, but you could think of, you know, converging photons as well. Converging and diverging light rays, this is now going to take us uh, into uh, the realm that we want to think about for black holes. Now, here's a famous, famous, famous Hubble image that shows uh, something called uh, gravitational lensing. See, that, see these kind of arcs that are kind of curved, like this one over here? It's kind of faint on the computer screen. On YouTube, it'll be very bright. Uh, those are caused by lensing, right? Almost everything in this picture is a galaxy. And some of the galaxies that you can't see are lensed by galaxies that you can see or clusters of galaxy. And their light, you know, it's like, it's like if you look through your glasses and things look a little bit blurry, uh, the, the light, that means the, the, the light rays are not focused perfectly. So if you, if you hold your glasses out here, things might look blurry, but if you got them right in the right place, they look just right, okay? They're focused. But if you're a little bit further out, it's gonna be smeared out and blurry, and that's what, that's what these, these kind of arcs are. And so this idea of gravitational lensing is another way to think about what light rays do. Converging and diverging uh, light rays uh, no matter what color they are, uh, can be affected by the presence of matter. So gravitational lensing. The path of a photon can diverge or converge depending on the presence of matter near its path. Right? Just as a, a photon of light can refract through your, your specs and then into your retina, if you put your, your glass right there by your eye, okay? If you don't have it there, then it just goes straight in, you know, and you might, you know, might not be able to read something, okay? And so the same thing here, you know, you, you get this, and it's not a piece of glass up in the sky with a refract, index of refraction or anything like that. It's the presence of matter. And just light rays curve around them. That's, that's the cool part of it. So let's talk about light and distance. Now, photons normally travel straight lines. If there's no uh, great amounts of matter nearby, space-time is flat, we say it, and every uh, second of travel gets another light second of distance, and it's on straight lines. And as I mentioned with the idea of lensing, curvature of space-time can change how that looks. Now, 
um, curvature of space-time is affected by the presence of matter. The sun has a lot of mass, and we can measure the gravitational curvature uh, near the sun. It's pretty weak. The sun is not that heavy gravitationally, so, but we can measure its curvature. Uh, that was one of the very first uh, verifications of the theory of relativity, in fact. They measured uh, that the, the sun could bend the light rays from stars and so that you could see a star behind the sun that you shouldn't be able to see because it's, starlight was lensed around the sun and focused uh, on the Earth. So um, in one nanosecond, a photon travels about 0.3 meters. Right? So that's 0.3 meters is, you know, like about this, you know, 30, 30 centimeters. So what is that? 30 divided by 2.5 is about 12. So it's about a foot, 12 inches. 2.5 times 2 is 5. 5 times 6 is, yeah, so that's 12. Yeah, so about 12 inches. All right, so in a nanosecond, you know. Uh, so about 12 inches. So if you, if you have a burst of photons, you know, like H-alpha photons, um, they're going to produce like a shock wave or a light wave, you know, a, a blaze of light that's about 12 inches thick, right? So if you beam out photons, you take your H-alpha flashlight and you buzz it for one nanosecond, you know, the, the head photon is going to be about 12 inches in front of the last photon that you buzz out. Now, if you do it in all directions, you'll have a spherical shell of H-alpha photons. So if you and your 12 uh, favorite friends, your 12 best friends, aim at a different, you know, 30 degrees apart, you know, and buzz out a nanosecond worth of H-alphas, you're going to get a, you know, kind of a shell, uh, or a ring, actually, of uh, H-alphas that's about 12 inches thick. All right, so I'm going to try to show you how that looks. Okay, so here's your, here's, here's you, here's the surface of a sphere. All right, and if you buzz out a nanosecond of photons, um, it'll be, you know, it'll, it'll form a, you know, in, in all directions, okay, It'll form a, a shell, you know, about 12 inches. Okay, so mark that. So give it some thickness. Give that outer, it's a shell, about 12 inches. So give it a little thickness. And I don't know, that's about 30 feet away. It's about 30, 12 inch segments. I should have. So every second, that 12-inch shock wave, it's 12 inches thick, uh, it would be another light second away from its origin and spreading out. So whatever the origin is down there, that kind of yellowish green, you know, if it's a star or if it's, if it's your favorite planet and you're beaming out red H-alpha photons. And the key is that if there's no um, great amount of matter nearby, so uh, not, you know, the sun does, the earth, they don't give it much curvature. Space-time, yeah, space-time is curved, but it's not very bodacious, not like a black hole. You know, we can measure the earth's uh, gravitational curvature, and we can measure it in the lab. It's not that hard, but it's also not very big. But at any rate, uh, for every second, that 12-inch shock wave is going to be another a light second away from its origin, uh, and it's going to be spreading out. All right, so the as I said, the light rays are going to be diverging, and that light cone is going to be look. It's going to look forty-five degrees. You know, it's going to be f plus or minus forty-five. Forty-five degrees left, forty-five degrees right. So make a note of that. If you if you mapped it out, you know you uh, you know when I say a, a shock wave, a spherical shock wave, twelve inches thick. That's not a space-time description. But if you were to 
put it onto a space-time diagram, you know, with time on the vertical axis and, um, you know, x-axis horizontally, then uh, it would be 45 and, and 45 left and 45 right, okay? So this is plus or minus 45 degree tilt. Unless you are near the event horizon of a black hole. And here's another artist's conception. You know, a blue giant and something nearby that was also pretty big and, and core collapsed into a black hole, accretion disk, very bright. Accretion disk is bright in all, and it's very hot. It's just putting out a lot of light, but it's so hot that its peak wavelength is not Roy G. Biv, it's not ultraviolet, it's out in the X-rays. And the hotter it is, the, cl the closer to the event horizon, um, the hotter it gets. All right, so let's talk about astrophysical black hole and its event horizon. Now, we're going to start applying this whole idea of converging photons of light in the light cone. All right, so we've got mass that's left over from a core collapse. So maybe three times the mass of the sun or more, usually. We think that's about where the smallest astrophysical black holes are. And they could be more than that, of course. Uh, so it collapses past the neutron star stability limit. And so no neutron degeneracy pressure. Uh, it collapses down to zero volume. And I'll make a note of that, zero volume. Whoa. The event horizon is so many meters away from the center of the black hole. But there's no matter there. This stuff collapses so quickly that it's shrunk down to the very center. So the, the spatial location of every neutron in the neutron star is R equals zero. And what that means, and, and it gets, gets to the center, R equals zero, um, that's very, very rapid, all right? And because all the neutrons spatially are at R equals zero, in a very short amount of time, we would say that there's zero volume. And so you might say to yourself, Dr. B, how can we have, you know, 10 to the 30 kilograms or more of neutrons in zero volume. Go ahead and write, you know, I should make that a clicker question. How is it possible to have 10 to the 30 kilograms of neutrons in one cubic meter? We can't, we don't know. know it. And this is zero cubic meters at the center of the black hole. The answer to that, so that's your question. How can we get 10 to the 30 kilograms of neutron into zero volume? Answer, we have no idea. We have no, we can't do it. But gravity knows perfectly well how to do it and it just, it squishes it all down there. And so he, this is the mystery of a, an astrophysical black hole. It has a mass, things will still orbit it even though it doesn't have any volume. There's no surface to it. There's a, an event horizon, you know, the point of no return, famous. Uh, but it, it doesn't have any volume. So it's, you know, the neutrons don't have any volume. And this location, uh, another vocabulary term for you, uh, R equals zero, the very center of this black hole after the core collapse, R equals zero, is the singularity, S-I-N-G-U-L-A-R-I-T-Y, the singularity. And the singularity of a black hole, if you think of space-time as a special kind of graph paper, you know, where you got light seconds and seconds and stuff, and, you know, four-dimensional graph paper, if you will, uh, a singularity is like a hole punched out of your graph paper. It's just not. There's no trajectory 
that can go from point A to point B and the, the singularity is in between point A and point B. If you're, if you're going from point A towards point B by way of the singularity, you stop at the singularity. You, that's, you, you can't go any further than that. You're done. That's the center of the black hole. Everything, every future ends, even the, the future of photons. Those, those uh, light cones, 45 left and 45 right, zapped. And they all end up at the light cone. It's, it's kind of cool. And we'll, we'll be putting that together um, today and, and tomorrow, uh, Thursday. So the, the event horizon, nothing, not even light can escape the black hole. Another common way of describing it, it's, it's kosher, you know. The event horizon makes, marks the point of no return. It's the distance. If you're inside that distance, your future is the singularity at r equals zero. If you're outside that, you can still get sucked in if you screw up. But if, you have, you know, if, you're, if you're wise and you have a good enough rocket, you can you know, boost on out of there. And at least you can orbit. You stay at orbit. And you're not going to be smushed down to zero volume. You, now, you might be, you know, there's tidal effects. You may be so close that you're, you're going to turn into, start, you know, getting pulled apart or something and turn into spaghetti. But, uh, but the event horizon is the point of no return. And so, as I said, the way to it, describe the black hole is geometric. Now, the, the other way to, to describe it is in terms of entropy. And that's the amount of information that you can send and receive if you're an observer. We'll talk about that on, 30, uh, on Thursday. And both of those are related to what photons do. So let's look at a little shell of photons for the last few minutes here. And let's look at some lensing that the sun does. All right, and then we're going to apply that to black holes. So if space time is flat, go ahead and make a sketch. Okay, so there's the Earth, and you're looking at this blue star up there. And the photons come burning straight in. The sun's over there to the left over here, so this green circle with the S in the middle of it, that's the sun. Uh, so you're not in close enough to get much gravitational curvature from that. So flat space time all the way to the Earth. Now that's normally what we see, all right? Um, now, if, if there is a region of curvature along the path, the photon's path is gonna curve. Now let me show you how that works, okay? So let's put the sun over here by the path, all right? So um, the path is gonna curve, now this one, this path is, is it's going to go straight into the sun, all right? Um, and the photon path is going to respond to gravity, even though photons have zero mass. They're going to bend. They're going to bend. You know, if you, if you, aim, a, uh, you know, if you aim a comet or an asteroid at the sun at super high velocity, it'll break out of an elliptical orbit. I mean, if you, if you attach, if Jenny decides to attach a super hot rocket to an asteroid, stops its spin, fires the rocket, and it can go past the sun and then just off to, you know, if it has escape velocity, it'll, it'll escape the entire solar system. And that would be one way of planetary defense. And it, it'll curve as it goes past the sun, but then it'll straighten out pretty much. Uh, it's called a hyperbolic orbit. Now this other photon here, now go ahead and draw in. Uh, the first one is a straight line absorbed by the sun. But this one, this one over here, the second one with the bigger dashes, now normally that's gonna go past the Earth, all right? But um, starlight gets deflected. And they actually measured this deflection of starlight back in 1919. Uh, they sent out an expedition and you know what they did? They looked at some, uh, a total eclipse of the SUN. And I believe one of the uh, teams was in West Africa and the other one was over in Brazil. And it was very difficult. That was the first verification of cur 
curvature. So this photon over here, you can't see, all right? That star's behind the sun. But these ones over here, yeah. So if you think, if you think in terms of straight line only for photons, that's, you should not see that star. But because that, per that second photon, the thick dashed line, because it curves or is lensed around the edge of the sun, and it has to graze really close to catch any curvature for the sun, because the sun's pretty pokey. Uh, but if, if it grazes the surface of the sun, you'll see it. But guess what happens? It seems to shift. It seems to be coming in from way out here. It's the same star. You know, you look at the spectral lines, you can say, oh, yeah, that's star X. But star X, what's it doing out there to the right of the SUN? See, you're looking out in that direction, and you're picking up that starlight even though technically you know it's behind the sun. So when you have this, um, that is gravitational lensing. Now, I'm going to give you one more picture before we dismiss. We're going to think this is like a thought experiment. A sphere of blue flash bulbs that all go off at once for one nanosecond. So a 12-inch shell expanding outward. Out it goes. And we'll talk more about those on Thursday. You're dismissed. I'll see you on Thursday. Pretty close to the end of what I wanted to do. Let me get my cursor. Hey, lights, please.